Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on circular and satellite motion. The topic of this video is the physics of roller coasters, and we want to know how does physics explain the thrill of a roller coaster ride, and how can we use Newton's second law to analyze the roller coaster experience. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. We flock by the millions every year to amusement parks to enjoy a 60-second roller coaster ride. What is it about these rides that cause us to pay costly entrance fees and wait in long lines just to experience? Is it the speed at which we travel? Absolutely not. It's not about the speed because we probably travel faster on our way to the amusement park than we do once we get there. The thrill of a roller coaster ride is in the accelerations that we experience. It's in the changes in speed and directions that we experience during the curved sections of track and the feelings of weightlessness and weightiness associated with these accelerations. A roller coaster ride is famous for these loops, these small hills and dips, and these bank turns. It's during these sections of track that we experience centripetal acceleration. In this video, we'll focus on centripetal acceleration experienced during these curved sections of track and how it produces thrill. One of the first looping coaster rides was at an amusement park in Coney Island, New York. It included a circular loop. Before the ride opened, engineers would test the loops with test dummies inside the cars to make sure they would not fall out when upside down at the top of the loop. But once the ride opened, they found out that the real hazard was not at the top of the loop, but rather at the bottom of the loop where riders would commonly black out or experience whiplash injuries. We've since learned a lot about roller coaster loops since those Coney Island days. Mainly, we've learned that you don't use circular loops. Instead, you use teardrop or clothoid loops that address the two main safety concerns. The first is that at the bottom of the loop, you want the accelerations to be reduced in size so that riders don't black out. As riders approach the bottom of the loop, they've been falling downwards for a second or two, and their blood has a tendency to rush out of their brain towards their feet. If the track curves too sharp, the accelerations are too large and riders black out. The second safety concern has to do with the top of the loop where riders are upside down. You want the accelerations to be greater than 9.8. If they're reduced to a value of 9.8 meters per second per second, then riders become free-falling objects and fall out of their cars at the top of the loop. That's just not good for repeat business. We address these two safety concerns by using clothoid shaped loops that have a continuously changing radius. The idea is that you want the radius to be significantly larger at the bottom of the loop than it is at the top of the loop. So that at the bottom of the loop, if the radius is large, the accelerations are small and riders don't block it, black out. And at the top, you want the radius to be rather small so that the accelerations are greater than 9.8 and riders don't fall out of the the cars went upside down at the top of the loop. While traveling through a clothoid loop, the magnitude and direction of a rider's velocity is continuously changing. This is the cause of acceleration. The diagram above me shows in blue arrows that represent the velocity vectors at various locations along the track. There's two things that you'll notice. First of all, the velocity is always tangent to the curve. And the second thing is that it's larger at the bottom than it is at the top, best explained by energy principles. A rider traveling through a clothoid loop experiences a centripetal component of acceleration acceleration due to these changes in direction and a tangential component of acceleration due to changes in speed. Here's a diagram showing four strategic locations within a roller coaster loop. At location A near the bottom of the loop the acceleration is upwards towards the center of the circle and at location B there's a centripetal component of acceleration directed towards the center of the circle and since the rider is in the process of slowing down there's also a tangential component that goes against the motion. At location see the very top of the loop, you'll notice that the acceleration is towards the center of the circle, directed straight downwards, and finally at location D, as the riders are just coming out of the loop, there's a strong upward component of acceleration toward, directed towards the center of the circle. When there's an acceleration, there is also a net force, and that net force is always in the direction of the acceleration. For riders going along curved sections of track, there's got to be an inward component of net force. Here we see an animation of two riders traveling through a roller coaster loop. The forces are shown. You'll notice there's two, gravity as expected, pointing downwards at all locations, and a normal force which varies in both size and direction. We're going to focus on two locations, the top and the bottom 
of the loop. At the bottom of the loop, you'll notice the normal force is directed upwards because the seat is underneath the riders and pushing upwards up on the riders. You'll also notice that the normal force is much bigger than gravity since we need a net inward force, which for this location would be upwards towards the center of the circle. At the top of the loop, you'll notice that the normal force is directed downwards downwards because they're upside down and the seat is above them, pushing them inwards. You'll also notice that it's a smaller normal force. Smaller for two reasons. First, the riders are traveling slower at the top of the loop and there's not as much acceleration. And second, you need net downwards force at that location and gravity is already pointing downwards. Normal force just makes up the difference between the gravity force and the net force. Let's use Newton's second law to illustrate these ideas. Here we have a problem with analytical, whose mass is known, traveling through the top of the loop and having an acceleration of 15.6 meters per second per second. We want to know the normal force on Anna. So as always, we'll write down what we know. We know the mass and the acceleration, what we're looking for, the normal force, and we'll draw a free body diagram showing the forces acting on Anna at the top of the loop. There's two forces, both directed downwards, the gravity and the normal force. Since both forces are directed in the same direction, the F net is equal to F grav plus F norm. And if we do algebra on this equation, we find that the F normal is equal to the F net minus the F grav. Since we know the mass of Anna and we always know the value of G, we can calculate the gravity force. And since we know the mass and acceleration, we can calculate the net force. Now that we know F net and F grav, we can plug it into the equation above and solve for the F norm on Anna. It comes out to be 281 newtons. So here's Anna who weighs about 475 newtons and her normal force is considerably less than how much she weighs. Now let's do another analysis for the bottom of the loop. Here's Anna, whose mass is still known, and now accelerating at 26.3 meters per second squared. We want to know the normal force acting on Anna's body. As usual, we'll write down what we know and what we're looking for. And we'll draw a free body diagram showing the forces at the bottom of the loop acting upon Anna. There's two of them, gravity that goes downwards as expected, but this time normal force upwards towards the center of the circle and much greater than the gravity force. Since these two forces are in opposite directions, we'll say F net equal F norm minus F grab. And we can rearrange the equation to solve for F norm. It's equal to F net plus F grab. Now since we know mass and the value of g, we can calculate f grab, and since we know mass and acceleration, we can calculate f net. And we can take these two values of f grab and f net and sum them up using the equation in order to get the value of the normal force. It comes out to be 1751 newtons, which is significantly, significantly greater than the weight of Anna. In the last two examples, we calculated the normal force acting up on Anna at the top and bottom of the loop. Normal force is a thrill factor that is related to our sensations of feeling weighty or weightless. The fact is that weight, or the force of gravity, is nothing that we can feel. We can only feel the forces that counteract the force of gravity. That force is usually the normal force, and on a roller coaster loop, its size varies. For Anna, she usually feels 475 newtons of normal force as she sits in her chair or stands on the ground. But when she goes through a roller coaster loop, at the very top of the loop she felt 281 newtons of normal force, making her feel much less weighty than she normally does. And at the bottom of the loop, Anna experienced 1751 newtons of normal force, making her feel much more weighty than she usually does. We have a term for for this and it's called the number of g's. We take the ratio of the normal force to the gravity force and that tells us the g factor or the number of g's. Normally that's one as we sit in our chair or stand on the ground and are not accelerating. But when we're accelerating our normal force changes and we experience less than one and more than one g's of force. We've been talking about roller coaster loops, but the dips and hills of a roller coaster ride are just as thrilling. It's at these locations that riders experience a blend of free fall with circular motion experience. The thrill comes from the accelerations they experience as well as the 
feelings of weightlessness and weightiness. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. The radius of the dips and hills section of a roller coaster ride are constantly changing as denoted by the circles that are subscribed over several curved sections of the track. At each of these locations there's a component of net force and acceleration directed towards the center of these circles. At locations B and F, the crest of the hills, riders are typically lifted up off their seats experiencing no normal force. And at times the safety bar pushes them downwards along with the gravity force to keep them in the car. We refer to this as negative G's. If the riders are no longer in contact with their seats at this location, then they're free falling objects or projectiles. So on the back side of these hills, we design it in the shape of a parabola since the trajectory of a projectile is parabolic. So along these back sides of the hills, locations C and G, riders experience free fall for a second or two and have absolute weightlessness. Finally, you have to stop the riders at some point. So at locations D and H, there's large normal forces directed upwards along with locations A and E. These large normal forces are directed towards the center of the circle, overcoming gravity and supplying the net force that riders need to travel through that curved section of the dip. Let's use Newton's second law to analyze the motion at the crest of a hill. Here is Anna again, whose mass is still known, who has a speed of 18.9 meters per second and is going over a hill that has a radius of curvature of 24.8 meters. We want to determine the force of the safety bar applied to the rider. So I write down what I know, which is the mass, the speed, and the radius, and I write down what I'm looking for, the force applied by the safety bar. And I draw my free body diagram showing the two forces on Anna. Gravity force down as expected and the force of the safety bar pushing down on Anna to keep her in the car. Now since both of these forces are in the same direction, the net force is the sum of them, F applied plus F grab. And if I want to calculate F applied, I would take the net force and subtract gravity from it. I can calculate gravity from mass and the value of G, 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And I can calculate the net force for moving in a circle as mv squared over r. All these values are given so I can calculate the net force. Now that I know net force and gravity force, I can use my equation above to calculate the applied force by the safety bar and it comes out to be 223 newtons. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you'll find on our website. We have a concept builder that provides great practice identifying the relative magnitude and direction of the forces acting up on an object moving along a curved path. We have a simulation page that actually allows you to design the hills and dips of a roller coaster or the loops of a roller coaster and observe the outcome. And then we have a written page from our tutorial section. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H. Thank you for watching.